Hello, my name is Karen Fletcher. I am the AICHE's CEO of the Rapid Manufacturing Institute, and we are at the 2016 annual meeting in San Francisco. And with me today is Jim Fitterling. He's the president and C chief operating officer of Dow Chemical, which is a large global material science company with sales last year of about $49 million. Jim, welcome and thanks for joining Thank me. Thank you very much. Uh, just a little bit more about Jim. Uh, he's a member of the Office of the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and in that role he has a hand in forming and executing the strategic plan for Dow and using technology and differentiation to build a global portfolio of businesses that are advantaged and deliver value back to their customer and their shareholders. Um, you're also the co-chair of our AICHG Foundation Doing a World of Good campaign, so thank you for that and for reminding all of us of the value uh, and the role that our profession can play in driving change. So, Jim, you're here because you spoke to our student conference this morning. It was a group of 1,800 students. You got a standing ovation at the end of the talk. It was outstanding. And the theme was, this is the best time to be a chemi. And so I'd like to just uh, have you share some highlights. You talked about the future of the industry. Maybe you could share some highlights for our audience. Yeah, so I, I think, and I mean that I really do believe it is the best time to be a chemical engineer. Um, we have some tremendous challenges in front of us as a society as we continue to grow, the population growth. Um, issues with natural resources, issues with the environment, uh, climate change, and all of these present a lot of challenges. Some of them are challenges to the way that we've done things historically. Some of the challenges to find solutions to problems that may have a solution today, but that may not be a very sustainable solution. Um, and some of them are challenges to things that we haven't even discovered yet. Um, we, certainly, we certainly see a trend of people coming to us with more and more difficult challenges and it gave me a lot of hope today to see in that audience you know, almost 2,000 know, very diverse students who are interested to come into this industry, into this profession and, and really you know, take something with them and, and apply it to things that we view as, as really breakthrough challenges for making a more sustainable world. Well, talking about the profession, how do you see the role of chemical engineers changing in the future? You know, I think in our, in our industry and in our company, historically chemical engineers were the heart of designing, building, running the plants. Um, and you, you might have said chemists or um, you know, technical service people were more the heart of how customers use products. So many things are changing today in the customer's world. There's so many demands being put on them by brand owners, mm -hmm. by the marketplace in general, by regulatory agencies on how to do things. And, and chemical engineers are uniquely qualified to solve those problems. Their knowledge of chemistry, their knowledge of how we do things in the process, their knowledge of how things work uh, and, and how the chemical reactions of those products work in somebody else's product, whether it's a cosmetic product, a home cleaning product, um, a, a plastic that you use in, in food packaging, uh, anything you're doing in the auto industry to lightweight a car without giving up strength and, and giving up safety. Those are all challenges that require a lot of knowledge and, and, and expertise and, and today the challenges go beyond just the chemical industry. They're, they're, you know, we talk about the fact that most of these are happening at the intersections of chemistry and biology and physics. Mm -hmm. You know, historically, we went through a big change in this industry from the 1900s to the 1960s where we were just inventing molecules. And now a lot of molecules have been invented. A lot of the periodic table has been identified. Now it's all about applying that knowledge and taking it to another level. And the amount of interdisciplinary work that has to happen to make things work is incredible. You can't make a smartphone device today or, or miniaturize any form of electronics without some very leading edge chemical products in the photoresist area, um, in the wafer polishing area, to be able to make that high quality product. 
And yet we see through the inter inter industrial internet of things that miniaturization of everything is getting to the point where all of our systems are going to be interconnected. Chemical engineers are at the heart of how you make those semiconductors to make that all work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one of probably a hundred or five hundred examples of where they have to apply that knowledge. So it's taking, rather than taking the traditional narrow approach to what chemical engineering does, really broadening it out and saying, you know, I'm going to be working you know, with biomedical engineers, I'm going to be working with biologists, we're going to be working on gener you know, developing uh, next generation um, prosthetic devices that have to interact with the human body, but that also have to mechanically be able to do the things that they need to do. We're going to be working with wearables in our clothes or wearables on our person that are going to be giving us information about how we need to live a better, healthier life. That is different, you know, that is a, a part of chemical engineering that I would say is non-traditional. We're going to be coming up with solutions to, to do things that we've done for 50 years the same way in a process plant because we can't afford to generate the waste that we generate out of that process or we need to find some way to do it that is, gives us cleaner air, cleaner water, less waste product, is more long-term sustainable. These are big challenges and um, you know, chemical engineers, I think, are uniquely qualified to tackle some of that. Thanks. Those are some fantastic examples. Um, let me change gears for a minute. You've been a strong advocate for process safety, as well as diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And I'm wondering if you could share a personal example of what's influenced your thinking on these topics. You know, on, <clears throat> on process safety, you know, I, I still believe, and I, and I think a lot of my counterparts in the industry believe that you're only as good as you operate and, and you're only as good as your impact to the environment and the community. Um, we want our employees that come to work every day to go home safely. We don't want somebody to come to work and have an injury or an accident. And by the same token, we want them to come to work in a safe environment. You can do many, many good things in the industry and you cannot operate safely and you can have one incident and you can destroy an entire company and the reputation of an entire industry mm -hmm. by that. We're all a byproduct of where we work and where we live. Um, our number one deliverable to that community and to the people that work with us is to operate safely and send people home safely every day. And that means we have to be committed to process safety just as much as we are to personal safety. And it starts at the very working level. Uh, for many years in the company, we've, we've had a focus on what we call loss of primary containment, which is a, we believe is a leading edge indicator to process safety incidents. If you can't keep things operating in the plant and keep them contained and keep things where they need to be and keep the slab under that plant dry, you're at risk of having a process safety incident. You have to focus on the most basic parts of this to ever be able to move to the higher level of safety. And for us it's worked. I think it's uh, helped us prevent an awful lot of potential incidents. But as an industry we have a long way to go um, because it only takes one incident to really cause a big problem. Right, right. Um, do you want to comment on diversity and inclusion at Dow? Yes, on, <clears throat> on diversity this has been I think a lifelong you know, journey for me. Not, not just from my own personal perspective but you know, I grew up in the I grew up in the '60s, which were a pretty tumultuous time um, from a social and racial mm -hmm. diversity perspective, and you know, not a very pleasant time to remember being part of. Uh, I started to work for Dow in the '80s, and actually, I, I started to work for Dow in the southeast part of the United States, um, where at times I was confronted with driving through small towns where Klan members were passing out leaflets at the intersections. And I vividly remember one incident where an African-American colleague of mine um, couldn't get in to see one of our biggest distributors. And uh, I remember our zone vice president, vividly, on a Monday, uh, we had a safety, a, a safety meeting and a sales meeting before everybody went out to do their job. And after the meeting, he came in and he said, uh, Bernard, come with me. 
and we were all nervous. We thought something's happened to Bernard. He took Bernard in his car and he drove him to this distributor two hours away, and he told the distributor, this is Bernard Scott. He's our representative for your company, and you'll do business with Bernard, or you'll never get another pound of product from the Dow Chemical Company ever again. Wow. And it was very impactful to me because it was what needed to be said and it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody higher up in management put it out there and put it on the line. Um, I've been involved with gender diversity for a long time, female diversity, for more than 25 years. Um, one of my first sales managers, a good friend of mine, was one of the highest ranking females in Dow. And at that time, you know, compared to where we are today, it was a very different world. Um, and as I said today, I'm openly gay and married and, and out in my life at work and outside. And, um, you know, we have seen through many, many years of being focused on diversity and creating a more inclusive environment, that it also inspires people. It gets people to work closer together. It changes their viewpoints. It makes them more open-minded. And if you're a company that's an innovation company and you're going to be providing solutions and you're so closed-minded that you can't be diverse and inclusive at work, then my bet is you probably are having some issues with really finding the right solutions to some of the problems that you're mm -hmm. facing. I think you're right. All the good ideas don't come from one place. And if we can't learn anything, we just have to learn that we have to be open and aware that people all around us every day are doing things better and differently than we are, and we need to embrace that. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful stuff. So thank you for sharing um, all of those experiences with us. Um, which kind of brings me to my last question. So open-ended, what, what advice would you give our young audience who's ready to start their career? You know, they have a, uh, this is a fantastic uh, group of young people. We sometimes refer to the millennials and and talk about, you know, I think maybe stereotypically sometimes about what the millennials are. One thing you can say for sure, they're one of the most open-minded, connected group uh, of young people we've seen. And it's so encouraging to see them focused on what some of these world challenges are. And and that is just a, a great resource for us to have at our, at our hands. We need to bring them into the workforce. And then we need to get out of their way and let them have a shot and doing what they can do to do things differently. Sometimes the hardest thing for us as humans to do, one, is reach out for help, and two, is get out of your own way. And uh, most days I go home feel like I still struggle with the latter one all the time. How do I get out of my own way to make it happen? Um, you don't have to make everything happen yourself. Take advantage of all that energy and all that youth and all that enthusiasm and let them in and uh, they need to bring their curiosity to work. Mm -hmm. The learning doesn't stop when you get out of school. It just starts. Uh, and in fact, the world is much, much bigger than anything they've been exposed to at school. So this is their opportunity to network, make a lot of friends, and really have an impact on the world. I look back at where the world was 30 years ago when I started with the company. And I look at where it is today, and I just can't believe how much change we've seen in that period of time. Yeah. And the rate of change is getting faster. So they need to really get ready and strap in because it's going to be an interesting ride. <laughs> That's a great point to end on. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining our annual meeting and talking with our connected audience. So it's thank you very a much, Karen. Thank you.